Yeah. Where is he? Let's see. Is he hiding? Yeah. Yeah. He just stepped out. He just stepped out. Carl, uh, just a quick question. How, approximately how long do you think the presentation on this first part is going to be? I'm thinking 15, 20 minutes. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, then I'll go ahead and call uh, uh, agenda item 6E, 2011 black bear season summary and related information. Game uh, division black bear biologist Carl Lackey. Uh, a presentation will be made by the game division's black bear biologist relative to Nevada's first 2011 black bear season and related topics. And just some background, um, we instituted our first bear hunt in 2011, and and uh, one of the things that we indicated that we would do, uh, that we promised uh, the public, was that we would uh, uh, come back and report uh, the status of the hunt. And so uh, this is uh, this is that report. Okay. For the record, Carl Lackey, Department of Wildlife. This is, uh, uh, if everybody has the uh, the sport material, the hunt summary that I uh, that we put on the website. This kind of follows in line with that. A lot of the numbers and the figures. So follow along there if you care to. This is a uh, a summary of the first hunt, last year's black bear hunt. 
All right, we'll start off with just uh, summarizing real quickly how we got here. I'm not going to go into a lot of the numbers that was done in <coughs> previous presentations to the commission and is available on the website as well. Uh, this is, we are now entering our 16th season of population monitoring data gathering. To date, uh, we've handled uh, 531 individual bears since 1997. Of course, the population estimate as of 2008 and the numbers that we established for the hunt were based on a 12-year period from 1997 uh, to 2008. Uh, 197 bears, as a reminder for everybody. From those numbers, that population estimate, we deter determined sustained yield estimates uh, based on our rate of population increase or lambda. That would be roughly 40 bears a year. 16% um, population growth. In other words, if 40 bears, put it in layman, layman terms, if 40 bears were killed, in addition to the bears that are being killed on an annual basis for other man-caused reasons, 40 bears were killed during the sport hunt, the population would remain stable at, at the growth rate that we're seeing right now. We made a management decision prior to this hunt, though, just to be extra conservative. We cut that, that uh, uh, estimate back, the quota back from 40 bears to 20 bears, and that's the number we went with. We used a success rate of about 44% times that 20 bear quota to come up with the 45 tags. Okay, now I'll talk a little bit about the, the conservatism in all these numbers. The quota of 20 bears, as I just mentioned, is only 50% of our sustained yield estimates. So if we kill 20 bears, the population is going to continue to grow and not remain stable. It is going to continue to grow. Um, those numbers were based on a very conservative population <coughs> estimate because of capture probabilities and everything else that I already mentioned uh, in the previous presentation. It was modeled conservatively. It was for that study area only, which was, for the most part, area 1929, um, and just a handful of bears in, in other areas. And uh, it is a growing population, as I just mentioned. Okay, well now, the hunt. We believe the hunt was conservative for these reasons here. We're protecting the female cohort and the population. Sows with cubs are illegal. And we are monitoring the percent females in the harvest, or we'll continue to monitor that. Uh, we used Utah's success rate of 44%. Now, keep in mind, that's the highest published success rate that we could find as of two years ago when we started this process. Uh, Utah allows hounds, and they allow baiting. That's one reason they have such a high success rate. We went ahead and went with that uh, to come up with the, the 45 tags. We do not allow baiting. We did not expect to see a success rate nearly that high. Total tags awarded, 45. Uh, as a reminder, we had 1,156 applicants. 1,124 of those were residents and 32 non-residents. Uh, 129 people applied for bonus points only. <coughs> total tags awarded, 45. Total number that hunted was 39. Success, successful hunters numbered 14. Overall success rate there is is 31 percent. Now if you're looking at the, the number of people that actually hunted and compare success rate from that point of view it's 36 percent but 31 percent based on the number of tags issued that's how we calculate success rate for all other big game species so that's what I went with here. Hunter effort measured at, at, at what is it what does it take to kill a bear in Nevada for this first hunt. 32.6 days on the average, days of field per hunter to kill a bear. Now that includes unsuccessful and successful hunters. Days scouted, this is probably one of the differences whether you were successful in, in killing a bear or, or not was in the number of days that you scouted. Just over a week to just over 3.2 days. And that varied from uh, zero days scouting to just over a month scouting, depending on the hunter. Our bear, uh, black bear man management plan, um, the, under that plan there are certain criteria, and I call them their, their safety nets is really all they are. Uh, certain things that we are going to use, thresholds that we are going to use to monitor the black bear population. We're looking at percent females in the harvest, uh, percent adult females within that female portion of the harvest and then we're looking at median age of males. Depending on which management plan you look at uh, across the West or across the U.S., 
different agencies will use different criteria. There's four or five, maybe six different criteria that, that, that uh, states will use. Those are the three that we chose based on, on what we feel is, is again, a, a good safety net for, for monitoring this bear population. Now, with all that said, we're, you know, we're looking at a three-year monitoring plan. We're not going to make any decisions based on one year. It's going to be averaged out over three years. And, and even that, that uh, we're talking so few bears in our, in our harvest, sample size is going to be so low. I don't even know if three years will tell us. But nonetheless, those numbers are in there, again, as a, as a safety net. Hunt results. Nine males were killed, median age of eight years. Minimum was four, max of 14. Average estimated weight, 428 pounds. BCS's body condition score, we rank them uh, from one to four, four being the highest. Uh, as you can see, 3.4, all these bears were in pretty, pretty good shape. Good pine nut year, carrying lots of fat. Uh, male to female ratio, 1.8. Again, that tells us we're, we're out there getting more males in the population than females which is what you want to see. That right there, as I had in the previous slide, that's the gauge for males, median age, that, that is in our management <coughs> plan. Five females killed, median age of nine years. A average estimated weight, 241 pounds, BCS 3.8. What we're looking at, again, per the management plan, is percent females in the harvest. You want to see it 40% or less, averaged out over three years and percent adult females in the harvest at 80 percent, you want to see something around 55 percent or so or above. You know, if, if, you're, if you're killing, uh, let's say you're 35 percent females in the harvest, uh, if they're all three years, then you're hurting the population. That's why we're looking at percent females that are adults within that female harvest. <clears throat> Some additional information uh, derived from uh, check-in lists. 12 of the 14 use dogs. Two successful hunters use licensed guides. 13 of the 14 saved the meat or parts thereof. 29 bears were treated or pursued but not killed by these guys that eventually ended up killing a bear. Two tag bears were reported treated and released, both females, uh, both in the pine nuts. Uh, in fact, one of these guys actually called me, the, the last guy to kill a bear, called me the day before he, he took a male said he had a bear in a tree, he had a tag number, he wanted to know what it was. He didn't see any cubs, so he wanted to know. Told him it was a collared female. Uh, we had denned her the last winter. She had three cubs with her, and I advised him, you know, he can do what he wants, but I advised him not to shoot her because she more than likely would still have cubs. He chose not to, kill a male the next day. The benefit of tag bears out there. With that said, though, no marked bears or tag bears were killed. Unsuccessful hunters, only six. I was able to contact either 18 or 19. I can't remember now. One more guy called in. But 18 of the 25 that actually hunted but did not kill a bear. S only six of them uh, used dogs. Two hunted in the Tahoe Basin. I was corrected on that uh, what, a month ago at the, at the uh, last bear sub subcommittee meeting. I had one hunted in the Tahoe Basin. Ms. Bricker corrected me. Uh, a, a guy that we know down in Carson Valley. It was a difference of opinion for the most part. Uh, I included him now as, as far as hunting in the Tahoe Basin. I was really surprised. Uh, even California gets a lot more guys hunting in the basin. One reported treeing eight or nine bears. Several reported numerous bears. Uh, the high of 14. Two tag holders hunting together saw 14 bears during the hunt, spot and stock only, not using dogs. Just weren't able to get on any of them. Two had opportunity to kill a bear, but chose not to. Uh, no tag bears reported at all. OK, uh, I'm going to show you guys. I was asked where these bears were killed. And hopefully, <coughs> with this screen, uh, is there a pointer around? I still look at the Well, I, I can walk up to the screen and point it out real quick. These are, these are the females that were killed. No. Of course, the one up here off of Garson Road, pine nuts, pine nuts, two there, one there, and one down there in the pine groves. Now, these are just generalizations. Uh, I only had actually two GPS points given to me on where guys killed bears. Other than that, it was 
south of Sunrise Pass, east side of the Pine Nuts near Sunrise, descriptions like that. Okay, there's the males. Tony, do you want to point those out? You can see them there, those blue, uh, here I'll bring them back again, there. Blue triangles are the males. Pine nut bears, there's your Carson Range bear, and then move south into the Desert Creek, and then uh, three over in the pine groves, okay? Fan of white? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> okay, but when we're when we're looking at number of bears and where they were killed and killed on the landscape, let, let's take away the state line, all right? Because that really doesn't tell us much, especially when we're talking about large carnivores. Zoom out a little bit, and just for comparison, now you guys can still see our harvest. These are the number of bears killed in California by county. That's, that's about as far down as they take their, their check-in, or as, as far down as we have of, uh, access to. By county, right along all those units, or all those counties that border our, our hunt units. 165 bears, okay, killed in 2010. Their 2011 numbers are not available yet, but 2010, 165 bears killed in those counties, in that area, roughly outlined in yellow, all right? There's Nevada's area, 14 bears killed in 2011. If we look back even further and look at the period from 2005 to 2010, California had over 1,100 bears killed in that area, compared to our 192. Now that 1163, I'm going to point out that is sport kill only. That does not include depredation kills, illegal kills, whatever, or management kills. Uh, that's 192 on our side, that's everything. We document every single mortality we come across. Just some numbers that, that are interesting and telling. For our, for our um, Hunt mortalities, when we go back even further in Nevada, and this is just for, for information, 1997 to present, 150 bears killed just by cars. Management kills, 94. Now I've been, we've been criticized lately that uh, we kill every bear we get in a trap, every bear we get our hands on. Just to set the record straight, management kills 94 from 1997 to present. We've had over 529 release events in that same period, okay? All right, I'm gonna zoom out even further here and show you guys a couple things when we're looking at a very, very broad landscape. Okay, once again, there's Nevada harvests right around Tahoe. There are the bears that I referred to in my last presentation. Vanna, if you would mind. <laughs> I'm getting heels for okay. now. <laughs> now, looking around Tahoe, the two that he just pointed to are over in the Sacramento Valley. Right there, two by Lincoln. Go clear north to Northern California, further north into Oregon, and then come clear down south to Lone Pine, California. Those are Nevada tag bears that we've marked over the years that were killed in California or elsewhere, even one up in Oregon. Okay? Um, there, I did it for you. Evidence of, of population connection, all right? Our Nevada bears, when we look at this population of bears, we're looking at a geographic population of bears, or, or so we surmise. Uh, has this been tested? We know we've been pulling hair from, from Nevada bears since 1998. That is a proposal that's on the table to look at east, west, north, south type movements for Nevada bears combined with California bears. In one essence, it's already, it's already been done. This is Brown et al. done in California in 2009, uh, Journal of Mammalogy. Now, if you look at the black triangles, basically what they came up with, they look genetics. I'll get up here. I'll get my pointer. Okay. They looked at genetics in California, and they, they came up with Basically, I'm not, I'm not saying distinct subspecies, nothing, nothing along those lines, not even close. But basically, genetically different, four different populations of bears. They had the, the north coastal range, all those things up in the, in the far uh, north 
west corner of California, the circles. There's one population that doesn't show up on this map. It's, it's clear squares, but basically they're northern California, northern Sierra population. Where we're looking at is this central Sierra population, the black triangles. And you can see black triangles all the way, black triangles all the way up into here, coming all the way down to here. Pretty much what I showed where, where our Nevada bears are from, all up and down here. And then there's this, this population of bears down in here. They call it the South Central uh, Sierra Nevada population. And interesting enough, they were able to document, get a genetic signature down there off of, they estimate 28 bears that were relocated by California from Yosemite down to those southern areas decades ago. They still, the, the, the genetic signature from those bears showed up in that population. So again, real good evidence of population connection. On top of that, and I know you guys have seen this map before, but on top of that, we know that Nevada bears spend time in California. This is GPS data. Thank you, Tony. <coughs> this is GPS data uh, that Beckman and I have been collecting over the years. This is just off of 12 bears. There you go. Point at the right direction. All right. Each individual color is an individual bear. Pay attention to that. That group right in there, I'm going to, the next slide discusses that. But of course, here's the state line. This bears over there quite frequently. This bears over here. Obviously, GPS collaring information is expensive, so just a handful of bears have had that kind of technology applied to them. But we know from telemetry data and from the previous slide that there's quite a few bears that, that spend time over there. Now, does that, is that proof that they're, that they're an interbreeding population? No, we don't know that until we actually run the genetics, but it's easy to surmise that that's exactly what's going on. All right, there's that one bear zoomed in now. Okay, Washoe Lake, Lake Tahoe. If you can see all those points, just hundreds of points, all up around Incline Village, down around the lake, Marlette, uh, top of the Carson Range here, and then several points over here in the Pine Nuts and points in between. Okay, we know that, again, from telemetry data, from tag data, even bears that we don't call her, that these bears move between the Carson Range and the Pine Nuts to the Buckskins. We've had bears go from the Wasik Range, the Carson Range to the Wasik Range, or back and forth to the Sweetwaters. Bears move around. Again, just real good information that we can't say that there's this wall up around between Nevada and California. And these bears stay on one side or the other because they don't. As a reminder, and again, this slide was in my previous presentation, that's the basin as outlined by the uh, U.S. Forest Service, okay? A map showing the basin. California has never had an incident between a bear hunter and the public in those areas where, where somebody was injured, and neither is Nevada. And, and again, with over 200 deer tags available, in that area, 192 and 194, averaged out on an annual basis, we've never had an incident between a hunter and somebody up there. Some numbers from the uh, Tahoe Rim Trail. Uh, I received these from Mary Bennington up there. And those ovals right there, that's roughly the uh, Spooner to Mount Rose section of the Rim Trail right in there. And that is the Echo to Barker Pass section right there. <coughs> Average 66 people per day during those dates, 2011, in the Spooner. And these are numbers. I didn't pick and choose what numbers I wanted. These are the numbers that were provided. They don't, they don't count every section every single year. Sometimes certain sections aren't available. But I took, I took that section because that, that, that section right there has been brought up quite a bit. And then I brought that one to comparison. Average of 299 a day. In the, two, in the roughly the same period, very roughly, 2009. But I think the important thing to recognize here is that a lot of these numbers, when you look at the, it was on the, the website of support material, when you look at these numbers, majority of the, of the uh, people using these, using the rim trail, using these sections, are between Labor Day and Memorial Day.
Now, I know warning signs. It was brought up about warning signs on the T Tahoe Rim Trail, and I, I want to point out that we do. We did install warning signs on the Rim Trail. They're on all trailheads on the Nevada side, uh, as well as in the state parks, Hobart, Marlette, some other places. Uh, did that probably, well, we did it again last year. Uh, the Lathrop students did it. Uh, but we first put up signs up in there probably two or three years ago. But they weren't signs warning people about hunters. They're signs warning people about lions and bears. We felt that was our duty. Let people know in case we have an attack, in case we have a serious incident, people have to know that they're recreating in barren lion habitat. Now why is that important? Well, that red dot right there, that's about five miles south of Mount Rose Meadows. Okay? The closest we've ever had to an attack happened in 2008. Now we did not classify it as an attack and I'll explain why. But it was this close. It could have been, it could have progressed into an attack. This gentleman right here, I'm going to refer to him as Sam, 16 year old male, through hiking the rim trail alone. His grandma or his mom, I, I can't remember which, would meet him at the end of every day at the trailhead. Feed him, they'd sleep in the car together, he'd take off the next day on the next section. Hike the next section and she'd leapfrog and, and meet him at the end of the day. So he was hiking it alone. Uh, in 2008, uh, it was roughly 4, 4.30 in the morning. Uh, he was in a tent. He had no food in his tent. He's very bear conscious. Pretty smart kid, really. Um, very bear conscious. And a, a bear came in and, and uh, collapsed his tent. At the time, he, he felt it was a bear. Um, <coughs> and he was under the impression, like a lot of people are, thinking about brown bear attacks, that if it's a bear, be quiet, play dead, and they'll leave you alone. Well, for reasons I'm not going to go into, if it's a black bear, you don't do that. But he, he stayed quiet and laid there. And the bear was pawing the tent that had collapsed, pawing through the tent into his sleeping bag, and that's how he got those marks on his back, right in there. The bear started coming up his back, nosing around, scratching around. He knew it was a bear, as I said started sniffing around his neck and he and in his words it started nibbling on his neck and it was right by his ear and he felt that he needed to do something so he just <laughs> I don't think I would have waited along that that long either but again he was a smart kid and he really had a lot of common sense when I was talking to him interviewing him he just exploded and said get out of here bear he was underneath everything bear took off he peeked out, the bear was starting to walk back toward him. He jumped up, stood up, yelled again, get out of here bear, and the bear took off. He classified it as a, uh, a, a smaller bear, black in color, uh, did not see any tags. I don't know if he w really would have, but he didn't report any. Now because of that incident, uh, Mark Kimbrough was the director of the TRT at the time. I called Mark. <laughs> He had actually already heard about it, even though this all occurred within, oh, within two hours. I was interviewing him and talking to him. Um, we posted warning signs on the TR TRT website. We closed Marlette Peak Campground. That was the closest campground to where this incident occurred. We thought, better be safe than sorry, we'll close the campground. There was really no way other than to, to helicopter a trap into the area that we would have been able to go in and, and go after the bear. Not really any way to do it. So we closed the campground, warning signs on the web. Uh, we put out a press release. And again, as I said, we classified it as an investigative. I don't even know what to say it was an attack, but it was curiosity on the bear's part, investigation. Uh, but it could have turned very badly had he not done what he was supposed to do. And again, he's sitting there just all smiles because he completed the rim trail. Uh, really, really good kid. All right, with that, any questions? Yeah, anybody have any questions? Any questions? <coughs> Seeing none, uh, uh, I think what we'll do at this point, uh, our lunch is ready, and so we're going to, the next agenda item is the, uh, the Bear Committee's report. And so why don't we go ahead and break for lunch and let, uh,
Gil, how much time do you need to do uh, your? Uh, well, potentially, people want to you know, participate in the demonstration. If we break for a half hour, would you? Well, it'll only take 20 minutes. Okay. How? What? What? What kind of period of time do you guys want to break for lunch? Long enough to eat. Half hour. Okay. Half hour. We're gonna go ahead and break for a half hour.